Welcome to chapter 11 of Services Marketing. Now this chapter is a bit of an interesting meta situation in that well back in the chapter set we talked about the flower of service and we discussed the concept of service as an auxiliary function of a physical product or physical goods. Here, what we're looking at is the possibility of using service as the auxiliary function of a service product. So the customer service function sits alongside the core activity, the core business, the core product. And this is a use of services, practices and procedures to enhance, augment and facilitate the delivery of the core service offering. So it does mean the flower of service is in play. You are looking at an overlap and interplay of concepts and ideas. You are also thinking about this from the point of view of you are attempting to facilitate customer satisfaction whilst delivering operational efficiency. I'd also emphasize that whilst the book talks about the dichotomy between satisfaction and efficiency, operational effectiveness sits alongside as a third part. So what you're looking for is an effective delivery of a service so that the service does what it's supposed to, an efficient delivery of the service so that the service has no waste or minimal waste time, and that can be capacity usage or time, expense, other costs, and customer satisfaction where the customer is satisfied with the performance to the point that they want to repurchase, rebuy, or endorse via word of mouth. Now, efficiency is not always the enemy of satisfaction. And one of the aspects here that you also want to be mindful of is that on a regular basis, when we start talking about concepts like efficiency, we start tending to try and pitch them as the business side, the corporation side, whereas what we need to do as marketers think, if we improve the efficiency, does this improve the experience for the customer? Does it create value for the customer? And does it create value for us? If we're more efficient and that efficiency creates a cheaper, faster, better service offering from our perspective, but doesn't improve customer satisfaction so that the customer is less likely to repurchase, it's not effective, and on the longer term, it's not efficient. So certain levels of redundancy and waste are okay if in the overall long-term picture, you have repeat purchase, repeat custom, and an ongoing satisfied customer base, which if you were to, you could make some short-term savings, but those short-term savings would actually become long-term costs. So you've got to watch that when you start talking efficiency. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the elements of the flower of service where customer service on a service means that we are thinking about now how do people augment that core service delivery. So it can be aspects such as you greet a customer. Now, there's a lot to be said. It's one of those things that when you first think about the Walmart greeter or the greeter, someone who welcomes you to a store, for the majority of customers, that is a person who's just going to say hello and you'll be mildly baffled about. You know, there's a person standing at the door who says hello when you walk in. The thing about the greeter is that they play a couple of roles. To start with, when you are met uh, with the smile and the welcome to the store, it may also include the, can I help you? How may I help you? Do you? Can I direct you? If you're uncertain about what you're doing at the service, you have a, an immediate window of opportunity to say, hi, new here, what's the deal? How do I, what do I do? Where do I go? You also have someone who's basically positioned at the uh, perimeter. So you've also got a security protocol. And you've got your first display of the fact that the service is about people. So 
these are actually more valuable roles than you might necessarily first see. And the idea of being met. Also, if you're being met at the door by someone in a uniform welcoming you, and particularly that person, if you're a repeat customer, they welcome you as welcome back, then it's kind of like being met by at sort of the doorman at an upper class, or door person at an upper class club, whilst you're going off to shop for groceries. Yeah, I know it's the sort of it's a psychic uh, emotive response thing. Your other elements, the Yulkant and the Flower Service, is that you are trying to engage, and you're looking at where do the augmented services assist. Uh, we're talking in terms of delivery, we're talking in terms of distribution, installation, repairs, so we're talking about acting on objects, acting on items. We're talking about the element of the flower service where we deal with customization, modification, uh, the billing, and what become a major part when we talk to chapter 14, complaint resolution, complaint adjustment. So all of these service roles play a part in augmenting whatever the core service you are setting up and they can use the services marketing theory to support. It is kind of meta that you are going to be talking about services as augmented product in conjunction with services core product. Or actual product as well. So what you're looking at in terms of where this will take place, again, one of the elements here that we want to really start emphasizing is that we're now having to think about services products in terms of categories, components, and, dis and whether this theory applies. So customer service may, and the flower service can suit where the customer will need people, and that can be um, the customer service option is people are accessible, where technical support are required, where you're dealing with multiple stages of a purchase process, so that you have a customer service relationship, say ticket purchasing, and the service you're buying, the flight, the accommodation, the theater event, is delivered by a different set of service staff. And we also have the aspect of information, the flow of information within a process of services. So there's more detail in the communication with uh, the customer post service purchase, post product purchase, follow ups, and other aspects. So we're looking again at this from the point of view of where are people going to need to contact the customers. All right, now I'm going to push you again, push you back to the textbook for this one because what we're looking at here is service standards, and the service standards break out a lot of, it's really unfortunate, but we are dealing with key performance indicators. We're talking KPI. KPI has become a square on the buzzword bingo. It's simultaneously, it's horribly cliche to talk about KPIs, isn't it? But they're really useful because what they are at the heart is a metric. What is important how do we know the important thing that we want to do has been performed and has been performed to an appropriate level? So the KPIs, a good KPI is one that is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timetabled, because a good KPI is based off your planning processes where you are looking at objectives, and the KPIs are, have we progressed towards achieving our objectives? There are KPIs in this subject. I've been using them on you for most of the semester. You, you may be able to spot them, but there are also performance indicators in, one of the performance indicators in any given subject is the assessment task. So you complete an assessment task, it's both a, a milestone, I've progressed this far down the course, and a KPI. I am now being assessed on how well I am demonstrating my knowledge and application of skills 
to this content area. Okay, so the other aspect of this chapter that we're looking at is we're looking at the concept of creating customer-led expectations and customer-led uh, goals, KPIs. So what we see here on this model and the area of the chapter I want you to look at is that we're moving here from the abstract to the concrete and that this is a very useful skill set when you look at a marketing plan. Now when we teach you a lot of things around marketing in terms of objectives and strategies, because we're teaching you in what is a safe learning environment, we're mostly keeping you up at levels one and two. We're getting you to talk about general concepts and principles. Sometimes we'll move you down to the dimensions. But when you're actually operating, it's not enough to say we want customer satisfaction. So well, what are the key parts of satisfaction? Oh, reliability, responsiveness, and empathy. Yes, but what does it mean to be reliable? Well, we deliver on time. That's reliable, right? Okay, what does it mean to be on time? What are the... So here on the stepping stones, it's we want to create satisfaction to create value for customers and for our stakeholders. We want to have an ongoing relationship with the customer and we want to provide a solution. How are we going to do that? We've got the core product offer. We've got the actual product. In terms of the expectations, well, we want to be reliable and responsive. What's reliability? It's accuracy to target. What's responsive? It's speed of reaction time. How do we put those into actual metrics, into goals? Goals that then become specific tasks. Task is, the goal is deliver on time. Task is within a day of the date we set. Said we will deliver on approximately the 25th, 24th, 25th, or 26th, the window of delivery. 27th is bad, 23rd is early. Too early, possibly. So we want to be looking at this in terms of how do we step down from an idea of here's the thing we want to achieve to a task we can tick off from a list. And that's what the KPIs need to be able to generate. You need to know what's important to perform and how to measure that performance. So beyond services marketing, you're also now reaching out into marketing strategy and you're looking at market research because the measurement of these particular aspects, and these are business behaviors, this is your internal environment scan. This is your internal metrics. This is, did we achieve our task? Have we met our goals? What are, if we aren't meeting our goals, is there a problem with the goal? Is there a problem with the implementation? So from this, one of the things that we're really sort of trying to get you to start th again thinking about, how do we put this services customer service function layer over the top of the service product. So where are the areas that it becomes important? And there are some key touch points, there's some key ideas. Is there an intermediary involved? Is the core service that you offer also going to use this uh, service function? Or are you responsible for the delivery of the service of the core service and you have a delegated intermediary who is responsible for delivering the service function, the customer service function? If so, that's going to change some of the designs. So your job is you're putting on the event, someone else is handling the ticketing, your job is to make the event work, their job is to sell the tickets. As far as the customer is concerned, it's one single process. Buy a ticket, go to event, attend event. High contact, low contact. Again, what's most important in your aspect here is that the people or the process. If it's people, then you start looking back at the uh, elements of the flower of service in terms of you know, customer service, where the people involved. If it's process, what are the elements that need to be behind the scenes that work? Which obviously means you're now digging up things like the service blueprint and looking at how the functions underneath your service, 
how can the service function facilitate and enable those. The other aspects that you're looking at here are capacity. So again, we're drawing on a couple of previous chapters. What happens where you've got the, again, you start thinking about things like customer expectations. What will the customer expect based on what the customer can reasonably assume your capacity? So you walk past one of those tiny little hole in the wall restaurants and you look at it and go, there's about 12 people's worth of seating in there. Oh, party for 15, now we're not even gonna get through the door. We're not even gonna be able to queue up in there to find out if we've got seating. So capacity constraints, time limits, you also want to be able to communicate these elements, so you think back to your IMC roles. You're also looking at the customer service function here of, will you be emphasizing repeat sales or single sale repeat service delivery? Now the importance here is if it's sell once, deliver multiple times, you want to have two distinct service function approaches. You have the service function approach that will handle billing, purchasing, and you have the service function approach which is about augmenting the service delivery. So you want to be mindful of the type of product you're using, the type of purchase pattern that's involved. You're also looking at elements of complexity. Remember, complexity is not inherently good or bad. So you can sell complexity as a feature, you can sell complexity as a bug. So you can simplify services or you can complicate services. This also means that you bring up the question of, with complexity and the customer service function, and we go back to the flower of service, do you also need to consider facets like the first couple of times someone attends the service, and particularly a co-created service, will you need to deploy staff to co-present to co-create, to assist the uh, customer in their co-creation. For example, if you go to the Build a Bear workshop, where the objective is go in and build a teddy bear. If you've never done this before, you're going to be walked through the process with a staff member at your side, helping you make decisions. And there's going to be a dynamic interplay between you and the staff member to try and get the best out of the experience. If however you're on your, uh, you've got a frequent flyer, a frequent builders club card for the Builder Bear, you probably don't want the customer assistance, you probably don't want the staff member there, because you're already, you've come in with a game plan in mind, you know their service, you're familiar with the service, you don't need the assistance. So in fact, having a staff member assist you would be a value loss rather than value gain. So again, look at your complexity, bug or feature, can you, if you've got a complex service, can you sell up the complexity as a bonus that you can charge more for increased complexity? All right, let's talk in terms of how to actually deliver the customer service function. You're going to see these four ideas recur when we start talking about, well, we're going to talk about any time that we're dealing with how to make a service really successful. You need the right team. And I've spoken before or and elsewhere on this about how you want to put together a good squad. You want to train that crew. And in training the employee, you're looking at it from the point of view of explaining how the service takes place. But you also have the concept of, of educating the employee, which is where you explain why processes take place. So if you think about, uh, again, go back to the Builder Bear workshop, people need, the staff who work at a Builder Bear workshop need to know how to operate the equipment, how to ring up a sale, how to uh, handle particular tasks within the production line. But if there's also a part of, there's a script, you know, they have to talk about the magic, you know, breathing life into the bear's uh, stuffing so that the bear has a heart. It's like, no, you, that's the how is recite the words. The why is explaining to them for the integrated marketing communications, for the service scape role, 
why this particular task is valuable for presenting a good service product to the customer. So putting some of the magic into it, going full Disney here, going partial Disney. If the employee knows why, why are we doing this? How does this fit into actually you know, selling the product and making the day useful for the customer? That will go a long way towards improving customer performance, customer experience, and reducing role stress and role confusion. Because it's not enough to know how, you also need to know why. Also in terms of making things work inside the service customer function is teaching the customer. The customer knows and the customer can be taught and the customer is willing to learn and the customer becomes a partial employee and you can go from how to why. You don't have to explain to them the logistics side of why, but you can explain to them the value. If you do this, it's just, you know, basically you're pitching the, if you follow our instructions and work with us, you gain more. You get better value. All right. Part two of the making it work element is, as been mentioned in the customer role stuff, look after your crew. It's customer service, augmented service is difficult. It's challenging. You need to be mindful of your crew and you need to value your team. And again, look at successful teams, the value of common goal, working together and covering for each other. The uh, text always talks about, you know, be, there is that particular th um, catchphrase, be polite, be professional. And if you know Team Fortress 2, you know the sniper's final line. Here it's be professional, be polite. A service that is done poorly but cheerfully ranks quite low. A service that is done well but brusque, abrupt, will regard as adequate. If you have a choice between being polite and being professional, be professional. Get the job done if, because the customer is there for the core benefit, which is the service. They're not necessarily there for you. So priority one, get it done. Priority two, get it done whilst maintaining some degree of human interaction with the uh, customer. Other aspects of this protocol is to bring in some standardization. You'll note a lot of what we do in the services marketing planning across the whole of the chapters is try to bring together protocols, flowcharts, spreadsheets, checklists, routines, help both from standardization. If inconsistency is a feature that you're trying to downplay, standardization through routine helps. If risk is something that your customer base is prone to, uh, they have a high risk perception or they have a low risk tolerance, routines reduce stress and they reduce risk. Price, cannot overemphasize the importance of give your customer a way in which they can understand how the price works. Have a policy, have some way that you can predict what the cost is going to be before you enter and commence the service really important because if you can't figure that out in advance it ups the risk level it ups the perceived risk and can lower the satisfaction because you couldn't work out what whether you're getting value until after the service and you've gotten the bill and then you're faced with the negative you're trying to work out did the positives outweigh the negative rather than having engaged with the service going well this is going to be expensive so it's going to be good and looking for the positives. All right, the final set of intel here is in all service function, you want to be proactive. The augmentation element, and remember you're looking now here at core product, actual product, augmented product. Augmented products are here to improve the performance. So you want to be trying to solve problems before they happen, or at least identifying potential problems. The role is to create differentiation and support. 
An augmented service on top of a physical good is a creation of value to differentiate or enhance the value of the product. An augmentation of the customer service function on top of a service product is to facilitate or to create value. The other element that's been raised a couple of times at this course is evaluation. And you need to look at this across the whole of the book. And this is where we've got the customer expectations to performance outcomes measures. When you are doing an evaluation, you are looking for success and you're looking for failure. You want to be able to understand unexpected success as much as you want to be able to understand unexpected failure. So evaluation and revision, you'll see this metric and the metric orientations kick into gear in the next couple of chapters. Effectively, you're looking, is there a problem? Can we solve the problem? Is there a strength? Is there an advantage? Is there something we're doing well? Can we repeat? Can we build upon it? Or is this something we don't actually want to do again? And this is one of the things you've got to consider here is when we talk about service evaluation, the customer learns. If it won't be sustainable for us to continually delight and improve upon the service, then we need to pull the service back to the level of adequate so that we are delivering an efficient service that is satisfying the customer, but not a, an inefficient service that is delighting the customer because we can't sustain the delight. All right. As always, if you need me, those are the contact points over the email, on Twitter, through the hashtag, or come around and make an appointment and come see me. At this point in the chapters, you want to be looking at your metrics and your tracking. You want to see where you at, how have you progressed against your research plan, how well are these concepts sitting with you, how easily are you able to answer the questions, maybe even go back and do a dry run through some of the older chapters and the other chapters looking at the questions that have been there. Overall, this is the service function chapter is one of the more meta chapters. It does contain uh, a crossover. As, again, you're really starting to see how these last few chapters are weaving in together the concepts from earlier in the book. So this is one of your uh, tasks in this closeout phase of a book is to look at what you've built up. 